Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Happy Thursday. Hope you're having a really good day. I've been glued to the coverage about Queen Elizabeth. I got my British shirt on from when I went to England. Oh, man, I'm so sad, guys. Not to mention my coffee maker just died. So I'm having a moment. Got to go to uh, Bed Bath & Beyond when I get done here and get another one because it wouldn't be pretty if I didn't. All right. So real quick, big thank you to Linda and Janice for the donations. Really appreciate your generosity. Song fact of the day. This is a song that like I never get tired of hearing. So the song Total Eclipse of the Heart that was sung by Bonnie Tyler was not written by her. But the songwriter explained he wrote the song after watching a vampire movie from 1922. And he said the singer is on edge, at times lonely and nervous. She's terrified. She calls out for her lover, ready to join him in a forever that may be more metaphorical, because vampires are immortal. So when he comes for her, it's a total eclipse of the heart. Forever starts tonight. And then if you know the lyrics, uh, once upon a time there was light in my life, but now there's only love in the dark. Mind blown. Never knew that until today. So there you go. All right. Last episode, we talked about just some interviews that some of the family members had given about this. Lori and Chad's attorney issued a statement saying they were just amazing people uh, and uh, all that stuff. So we're going to pick back up on December 23rd. Uh, Kay tells Fox 10 Phoenix, if I have a worst enemy, I would never wish this on them. I would never wish this on anybody. Lori just turned off. The person we knew just went away and she did not want JJ anymore. They were just, they were just trying to tell her, God, please let her go to a fire station, a church or something. We were just trying to tell her. Yeah, I can't imagine uh, the panic at this point. It's been months since they've seen him. The last FaceTime was brief and... Yeah, so uh, Christmas Eve, December 24th, Melanie's and Ian show up at Melanie's dad's house at 1030 at night looking for her kids. She calls and asks to visit, saying she was four minutes away, but actually she was already sitting out front. And her dad thinks that she said that to see if the kids would be moved out of there when she arrived. And she also told her dad that she had Christmas presents for her kids she didn't want to answer any questions about JJ and Tylee. And then when her dad asked who she thought took a shot at Brandon, she said, how do you know Brandon didn't shoot his own vehicle? How do you know one of his work buddies didn't shoot him? Um, she also cried about the death of Alex to her dad. And at the mention of Lori, remember we've said that, that she had this, you know, felt abandoned or this codependency on Lori. So she's by herself up there in Rexburg with a husband she barely knows. Um, she asked to go to the basement where her siblings were. And so she went down there for about five minutes and came back upstairs and left. And her dad thinks that she actually went down there to see if her kids were there. In all, he said she stayed around 45 minutes. And after that visit, she cut off all communication with him. He did say on March 8th, uh, 28th of 2020, she had recently contacted him to wish him a happy birthday. Uh, the man who served his mission with Chad told Fox 13 in learning about this whole situation, I was just horrified, shaking when I first saw it because this is the last guy that I ever thought would be involved in something like this. So Christmas Day, Kay emails Detective Moffat. She's been looking for JJ's DNA card results, but she hasn't found it. She says it could be in their old home, but they have renters and may not be able to go till the next day. She did say they were willing to pay to have JJ's biological dad be tested if it would help expedite things. So the next day, Detective Moffitt emails came back saying, um, looking at the rental house is fine, even if you went and looked over the weekend, because that would be quicker than having a new profile extracted from JJ's biological dad. And he says, I hope you get to sleep in this morning. Kay had told uh, Detective Moffitt, obviously, she's been struggling with sleep schedules and was all over the board in that area. So 
on web sleuths there was a post by a relative of chad i believe maybe a nephew so i'm not going to read the whole thing it's kind of all stuff we know it's, but he says the family is pretty shaken with all they found out and he says that he and his brother are investigating what they can to try to piece some things together so um he says they're running theory that they have right now is that Chad and Lori have known each other for years, at least seven, very likely more at this point. Um, they've done, he, he mentions they've done podcasts together. And also it seems they both were together on that AVAL forum, a uh, voice of warning. Chad's account has been deleted and disabled on AVAL. And he talks about how it's hard to access AVAL because uh, it's a pay site. Me and Fruit Loop totally paid to get on there in the very early days of this case. I wish I still had those screenshots. I think I do, maybe on my old backup. I'll have to try to find them because like, we were just literally screenshotting for a long time. There was so many messages. Um, some people from Ava, he says, some people from Aval recall Lori and Chad being very narcissistic and claiming LDS authority figures will listen to them in the future. It also says um, that other members of AVAL have been in trouble with the law, but he says he hasn't looked into that. He goes through just the timeline that we know of about the welfare check and Tammy's murder. You know, it's really disturbing, and I do remember seeing this. AVAL members were taking screenshots of, like, Kay and Larry and, and posts made by them and were putting them inside that message board. There were some really nasty things that were said about Kay and Larry in there. The same day is when Gilbert investigators talked to Ian's sister, Hannah. Remember, Melanie and Ian spent Thanksgiving with her right before they went and got married. She said two weeks ago, Ian said Melanie was told Al may have taken care of JJ entirely, but she didn't know what that meant. Also, um, they if you remember, I think the last episode, we talked about them finding some DNA in that rogue that Colby had. Um she said it was possible it was Ian's kids, but she was unaware of any injuries those kids would have had that would have caused bleeding. So on December 26th, also, Lori and Chad both are named as persons of interest in JJ and Tylee's disappearance. And I remember when this happened, and I remember as January passed, it was like, when are they going to arrest them? Let's go. These kids are missing. What's going on? Finally, you know, February, we know, but... Seems like a, a really long, two almost two months from the time this hit the news until we actually saw Lori get arrested. So also on this day, Kay and Larry go on the Gray Hughes podcast, which is a great podcast, by the way. Uh, Kay says she's never met Brandon in person, but he has become a part of their family now. She also mentions that JJ has ADHD as well as autism and takes his medications to sleep. She said if he doesn't have that medication, he only sleeps a few hours a night and he's a mess. Yeah, I've, I've seen that. My little eight-year-old nephew, he can be a mess sometimes. Whew. But man, I love him so much. Like autistic kids, they're the best. Once they got him on that medicine is when he really could slow down enough to get some good sleep and it would keep him calm during the day as well. Medication for autism is very life-changing to uh, a lot of times to parents and the kids. But uh, I, I certainly have no opinion and have no right to an opinion of parents who don't medicate either. That's a personal choice. December 27th, Lori and Chad are seen under surveillance. I'm going to add this to the stream. This link for the pictures will be up in the uh, description of the episode. Um, there's a photo of what I believe are a few of Chad's kids. The bottom left picture to me, I don't know if that's one of... Tammy and Chad's kids, but you know, it's blurry. It's very bad. Uh, I mean, I know it's from a distance, but it's not clear. I should put it in my little app that clears it up. It looks like Tammy Daybell to me a little bit from a distance, just a, you know, um, I can't tell who these people are. I can see Chad. I can see Lori, but I don't know uh, what Chad's kids look and not look like enough to uh, guess who's who. But if you remember the last episode, we did talk about some emails between investigators. Clearly, they were watching internet activity of Chad's kids or Chad 
or they figured out that there was going to be some travel to Hawaii to visit Lori and Chad during the holidays. Um, so I'm going to keep these pictures up just for a second while we keep going. Julie Rowe does an interview with Fox 13 Salt Lake City. She said Chad had told her angels had told him that he was going to lose Tammy. She also said told, um, said Chad told her he did not want to get out of the public. He wanted to get out of the publishing business, but Tammy did not. He told Julie when Tammy passes, he's done with it. She also said she has visions that the kids are safe, saying I can see them. I see their energy and th that they're in a bright house. Um, also on this day, an anonymous friend of Lori's talked to Fox 7 Austin and said Lori had become obsessed with Chad's books about four years prior. She says she can't wrap her head around what's happening and remembers Lori as an amazing mom who devoted herself to Tylee and JJ. She said she would fly her daughter's friend from Arizona to come see her just so she would have a better week. I mean, she's like mother of the year here. She was 100% into the end times, the end of the world, and she would tell me, no, you really got to start preparing for the end of the world. You got to start getting your stuff together. She would order stuff all the time, and she would tell me I needed to read all these books, which was the Standing in Holy Places series written by Chad. I believe that was the one that apparently really like she latched on to. And those books are really, uh, she got really obsessed and started buying me these books too. She must have gotten close to him from his books. Lori would say things to me like, I'm never going to get divorced again. I'm on my fourth husband. And then, then she would tell me, you got to get rid of your husband. We just go off and do our own thing. She also said Lori would say it's going to be the end of the world and we should all just drive off a cliff and kill us and our kids and die all at the same time. I do believe that's something that Joe Ryan's sister and Tylee's Aunt Annie had heard when she visited her at some point as well. So this wasn't the first person that she said that to. So on December 8, uh, 28th, uh, April Raymond said Lori was last seen at an urgent care facility with Chad a week ago last Saturday. So I cut y'all. I can't math. It's my brain goes no, no, no. But I think December 28th would have been the date that she was referring to. She said this in January 7 of 2020 in an interview she did with, I believe, East Idaho News. Also on the 28th, Rexburg Police Captain Gary Hagan told East Idaho News, I don't think we're any closer than what we were two weeks ago. Time is always of the essence in any case, especially something like this. And he also kind of touched on whether or not this is over a child custody battle. He said, that's what they claim, but we have proved there is no active custody battle. December 30th, Rexburg PD and the FBI published their press release announcing that JJ and Tylee are missing and asked for the public's help. And it's an update on the missing children. And I'm going to read this now. The Rexburg Police Department and the Madison County Idaho Prosecutor's Office want to thank everyone who has worked with us to find Joshua Vallow and Tylee Ryan since our press release on December 20th. The search for Joshua and Tylee is ongoing. We appreciate everyone who has brought attention to this situation by sharing information with our offices and on social media. We're very grateful for the help of the FBI and their resources. Finally, we are grateful for all the media outlets who have shared press releases and stories relating to these missing children. We continue to welcome any information regarding these children's whereabouts from informed citizens investigative journalism, or any other source. Since we first received a missing child report on November 26th, our number one priority has been finding Joshua and Tylee. We've taken every step available to us, including executing multiple search warrants, interviewing multiple sources, and running down every lead we found. We strongly believe that Joshua and Tylee's lives are in danger. We are aware in the weeks after Tammy Daybell's death, Lori and Chad told witnesses that Lori's daughter had died a year before the death of her father, which is untrue. Around that same time, Chad told another witness that Lori had no minor children. Many people have inquired as to why we have not filed charges yet in this case. Our primary concern at this point is simply locating Joshua and Tylee and charging decisions will be made in due course based upon the evidence available. 
if we find that harm was done to these children within our jurisdiction, we will prosecute whoever caused the harm. As stated in our previous press release, Lori Vallow Daybell, the adopted mother of Joshua and biological mother of Tylee, has completely refused to assist this investigation. We know that the children are not with Lori and Chad Daybell, and we also have information indicating that Lori knows either the location of the children or what has happened to them. Um, so that's curious. Um, if you remember, I believe it was early December, we pointed out, and we don't know for sure this is who, but Ian and his ex-wife were interviewed up in Idaho. And in the notes, it said that a person that was close to these people said that the children were dead at the hands of one of the parties involved. So I kind of think maybe that's where this statement came from. Uh, despite having this knowledge, she has refused to work with law enforcement to help us resolve this matter. It's astonishing that rather than work with law enforcement to help us locate her own children, Lori Vallow has chosen instead to leave the state with her new husband. We publicly call on Lori Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell to do the right thing and come forward with the information they have about the location and welfare of Joshua and Tylee. This entire investigation could have been avoided if Lori and Chad had simply been honest with law enforcement. We further continue to ask that anyone with any information regarding the location or welfare of Joshua and Tylee share that information with law enforcement. And so I, one thing, too, that I want to say is one of the reasons that I am going through these press releases is just to keep the timeline like current. I know this is kind of old news and in retrospect, we know what happened, but um, I, I really want this to be a place where, um, you, you know, I can refer to five years down the road if I'm thinking about this case and, and kind of get that timeline. So I'm including as much interviews and things like that as I can, because it's also important, I think, to know what everybody was thinking at the time this is December. The kids' bodies weren't found until June of 2020. There was a long way to go in this case. And as we know, at this point, less than two months, Lori would be arrested. But yeah. So also on this day, Julie Clement says she spoke to Chad and Lori, but would not give their phone numbers to authorities. December 31st, there is an, ad an additional search warrant that was drafted for Chad's F-150. And we're going to stop real quick and do our next to the last uh, word from our sponsor of the week, Better Help. So when we can't figure out why our TV is on the blink or the washer sounds like it's a helicopter, uh, what do we do if our car is making a funny noise? Most of the time, we take it to a professional and let them figure it out. And, um, you know, we try to find our own solutions, but if, if you've ever done anything like that, it's super frustrating. I, I tried to take apart my, my carpet shampoo the other day. I just went and bought another one. I couldn't get it back together. Couldn't figure it out. So when our solutions don't work, we need to give in and call for help. We need to treat our brains as kindly as we treat our bodies or our TVs or anything that's valuable to us when it starts acting up. So sometimes we need a professional to help us problem solve. Problem solving can be easy when you're helping other people because you're neutral. You're on the outside. You can look at it without as much emotion attached. But sometimes if you're like me, when it comes to problem solving in your own life, whether it's big or little, with everything you have going on in your life, it's just too much. You can't do it. You can't find a solution that works. And half the time, we're problem solving for kids, parents, friends, everybody else. So what do you do? Well, maybe you get therapy. And what can you get from trying therapy? Well, you can unload your stress. You can have some emotional healing. You can get help with anxiety and depression, coping strategies, and all kinds of other ways to make your mental life better. Um, better help can help you navigate depression, stress, anxiety, self-esteem issues, anger, relationships grief, eating disorders, and more. If you're thinking of giving therapy a try, BetterHelp is a great option. Get matched with a therapist after filling out a brief survey and switch therapists at any time. So when you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. 
Visit BetterHelp.com slash WhatTheWorld today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash WhatTheWorld. All right, so back to it. January 2nd, 2020. Zulema locks down her Facebook and Instagram pages after it was confirmed in an online group that she was the wife of Alex Cox. Why would you do that? I mean, it seems like, you know, if you married him, you'd be proud of him. Flaunt it. Why you hiding? Um, the search warrant on F Alex's F-150 is executed. They redact whatever they took for forensic analysis. I do remember there was not much found in that truck at least as far as what I could tell in the documents. So um, self-storage also notifies police after Lori, Lori's payment method was declined. And they, uh, if you remember, I believe they executed a search warrant there. Then they Eaton is called. And then Keith Morrison shows up there at the storage. That storage owner probably was like, what in the world is going on? Uh, February 3rd, 2020, the FBI, Fremont County, and Rexburg PD execute a search warrant at Chad and Tammy's house. They use metal detectors around all around the house. 43 items of interest are taking, taken, including electronic devices, journals, medications, papers, and other things. Sheriff Humphreys said the search was primarily related to Tammy. And when the home, uh, when they were finished in there, they released it back to Chad's children. And I did have a photo, but I don't think I uploaded it in here. My bad. But, you know, it's always really weird to me to see that the pictures, because knowing what we know now, you see them in the side yard. They're with an eye shot of where these kids are buried. And um, same thing also, I believe, with Kay and Larry. It's... Um, they rode by there or something, and yeah, it's it's just so strange. Also, on this day, Colby goes on Good Morning America and says he has no idea where JJ and Tylee are. The FBI confirms they're assisting in the search for the kids, and spokesperson Sandra Barker said we were contacted by Rexburg Police on November 27th. I won't get into details, but we're offering investigative, forensic, and technical assistance in Idaho and Utah. Today, members of our evidence response team are in Rexburg assisting with evidence collection. Our victim specialist has also been made available to the families of Joshua Vallo and Tylee Ryan. Same day, Fox 13 Salt Lake City interviewed Sheriff Lynn Humphreys, who says they believe the death of Tammy is related to the kids. He says there are two pieces of this and how they're related. We're not quite sure. We do believe they are related. Um, Chad and Lori refused to speak to law enforcement and have left the state. He said a lawyer reached out to them saying he was the point of contact for the couple. Remember in the last episode, we had that uh, he was a loving husband. She was a doting mom or whatever. Um, we, do, we do think they left Idaho, Idaho, but that's all. That's about all. So I don't think at this point. Um, yeah, Lori and Chad were in Hawaii. I'm sorry. Uh, January 4th, Kay emails Detective Moffat that they found Bailey, JJ's service dog that Lori so cruelly took from him. They said he was rehomed with a special needs boy and he's doing great. And Kay and Larry said they're relieved that Bailey is in a good place. Bless it. Uh, January 5th, Colby uploads a YouTube video asking his mom to do the right thing, saying that she has the power to end all of this. And he asked her to let him FaceTime Tylee and JJ so he can see for himself that they're okay. Also on this day, Kay and Larry fly to Rexburg to meet uh, with Rexburg PD and the FBI to discuss Tylee and JJ. Kay said she loved Lori like she was a sister, but thought Lori was cheating on Charles with Chad because of the emails they had exchanged. And... Um, she told East Idaho News, I don't have any expectations. I've never done this before. I have no idea. I just feel like I need to be in Idaho. I'd love Chad and Lori to be arrested. Have her in one room and Chad in the other? Absolutely. Charles told me he had recordings of her. He said, nobody will believe me. And he recorded her one night. Even though it's deleted, nothing is ever deleted electronically or whatever. 
However that is, for her to say she's a translated being and she's reincarnated, that is scary. Yes, it is. Also, on January 6th, Kay and Larry have an interview with Rexburg PD, and they give a lot of background information that needed to be followed up in Arizona. And a lot of that was redacted in the report, so maybe at trial that stuff will come out. They also, on January the 6th, serve a search warrant on J.J. School in Arizona. The same day, Sheriff Lynn Humphreys told East Idaho News, when talking about Tammy, we're looking for poison, but we're just having to wait for lab results. You could say we're sort of in a holding pattern right now. From an investigation point of view, this is a disaster. There are multiple agencies involved, us, Rexburg Police, the FBI, as well as police departments in Arizona. There are people who have died strangely in several places and two kids that we have absolutely no idea where they are. Add to that, the mother is known to have told family members that her daughter died a year ago, which we know is not true. And then she claimed that the 17-year-old had run off with the 7-year-old and didn't say anything to authorities. What kind of parent doesn't help try to find their own kids when they're missing? Humphreys believes that uh, Chad and Lori have left Idaho but are still in the United States. Just got an alert. Uh, Queen Elizabeth has died. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sad. Dang. Um, so we'll keep going. Tylee's friend from Arizona shares with the post registered that the last text she got from Tally's phone on October 25th was at 11 14 a.m. And the friend wasn't sure if Tally sent the text. We know now she did not. She had texted Tally on October 19th to say she missed her and had been thinking about her. Six days later, she got a reply. Hi, miss you guys to love you. And it's L U V Y A. The friend said the text sounded nothing like Tally. She spelled out her words for the most part. Plus, she would have texted more if I reached out. And when she lived here, she responded immediately. And when she moved, it slowly, de slowly decreased in response time. The friend said that Tylee had originally planned to stay in Arizona, but decided to go to Idaho for JJ's sake. Tylee never mentioned her mother's religious beliefs to her. And uh, Tylee had said they were moving to Idaho because Lori had gotten a job. Interesting, she never told her friend she was going to BYU. I. Um, apparently, that was false, like she said. The same day, Charles's divorce attorney releases a statement. And it says um, his, his name is Stephen Ellsworth, I believe. Um, let me see who signed it. Yes, Stephen Ellsworth. It says the statement is made in response to the various news articles and reports regarding filings made in the Charles Vallow and Lori Vallow dissolution of marriage case. In early 2019, Charles retained our firm to initiate divorce proceedings on his behalf against his wife, Lori Vallow. During our representation, Charles express, expressed a genuine fear for his life and under our advice, obtained an order of protection against Lori Vallow. We are saddened to learn of his subsequent death at the hands of Lori's brother, Alex Cox. During our time representing him, it was clear Charles loved his children, including Tylee and JJ, very much. His main concern throughout the case was ensuring JJ was safe, cared for, and that JJ's routine was consistent due to his special needs. Charles shared some of the same concern for Tylee, but Tylee was from a previous marriage and not a party to the dissolution matter. We hope that the focus of this tragedy is placed on locating the whereabouts and well-being of Tylee and JJ. And that's um, that signed Stephen Ellsworth and F. Taylor Larson. So we're going to finish up here soon. Uh, January 7th was Melanie's court date for trespassing at her in-law's house. Also, Kay and Larry have a press conference and offer a $20,000 reward for information in the case. Uh, Kay says JJ loves to swim. He's hardly afraid of anything in life. Tylee's a typical teenage girl who graduated early from high school and has a close group of friends. Kay and Larry spoke with JJ several times a week, and often those conversations were short, but it wasn't unusual for JJ to call his grandparents back several times in the same day. Lori never stopped the Woodcocks from talking to or visiting with JJ kind of in the past. 
during their last FaceTime with JJ in August was 25 seconds. And it appeared someone was monitoring what he was saying and he didn't call back after that. They also noticed that JJ's hair did not appear to be well kept as it had been previously. We all know Lori used to be a hairdresser. Kay said that Lori took exceptional care of JJ's hair. The picture of JJ on the missing poster shows his hair matted and not in its usual style. They also launched a Find JJ and Tylee website asking for tips from the public. Larry says, all I want before I go is just to see those children. I just want to hear him beat on the drums. I want to hear him say, Papa, let's go ride or let's go to Checkers and let's go get a hamburger. I'm hoping beyond hope that that happens in the near future. If somebody two years ago would have said, this is what's going to happen with Lori, I would have never believed it. Kay would have never believed it. If Kay and I would have had any thought in the future that we were going to be involved in an issue like this, we would have never have let JJ up for adoption. It would have never happened, and now this happened. Lori was a good mother when JJ was young. You couldn't ask for a better mother. Kay said, please just let us know where the kids are. It's not difficult. It would end all of this. We don't know why we weren't allowed more access to him, but we reached out constantly in every way, email, voicemail, text, phone call, whatever, and never, ever got a response. So that is very concerning to us. So when Kay was asked about Lori saying that Tylee had died in 2017, Kay said, it sends chills up our spines. That's just what brought it home for us. Oh, my God, this is something really bad. And that's very much what happened to y'all. You know, one thing I've seen consistently over the past uh, couple of years, especially after the document dump and the custody battle, was people saying, K or, you know, not K, I'm sorry, Lori, um, People that think Lori was a good mother, you know, she was never a good mother. Yes. But here's the thing. And I always say this when people say this to me. People can put on a front for you to see what they want you to see. And I think Lori was a master manipulator. In hindsight, with everything we have, it's easy to say she was never a good mom to Tylee with what she put her through between the custody battle with Joe Ryan, constantly moving different husbands, um, having to change schools all the time, moving to Hawaii, moving back to Arizona, moving to Texas, moving to Idaho. She never had consistency. That's not the traits of a good mother. But, you know, you have to give people a break that spent time with her. Um, it's easy for us to kind of assume that, like, we can say now she was a horrible mother all along. Yeah, but... I've dealt with people in my life, and I'm sure you have too. You see one side and then something changes and you're like, wow, I had no clue this is who that person really was. So I always defend Kay and Larry or anybody who says that um, they knew her personally and she, they, she was a good mom. You can give that, you know, image all day, every day if you're good enough. And then you find out people's true colors and it's it's not what it was. So anyways, I always like to bring that up because I know I'll get comments on it. And I just want to say you can't fault people for, um, you know, trusting, for being trusting. If you don't have a reason not to trust somebody, then you're going to trust them. All right, guys, we're going to be back tomorrow to end this week. And uh, Tuesday, hopefully openings in the... Uh, Wagner case. I may take Monday off. I think I just maybe I'm just going to take a long weekend to kind of unwind. I am hoping to have the online store up and running at some point this weekend, redoing everything. I've changed things up a bit. Hope you guys will like it. I will put that out when it's done. It's going to be prettyliesandalibis.com for merch. It's not up now, but it will be soon. All right, y'all have a good rest of your day.